Hello and welcome to the fourth virtual talk in MISC Art Institute's six month series of conversations with leading industry experts. Uh, my name is Oliver Farrell. I'm the Education Program Manager at MISC Art Institute and I'm your host for this talk. What is contemporary art? Uh, our speaker today is art critic, curator, and all round contemporary arts expert, Lina Lazar. Lazar began her career in the commercial sector as the first specialist in Arab art at Sotheby's Auction House in London. As an independent curator, Lazar has curated two pavilions at the Venice Biennale. The first was the Pan-Arab Pavilion in 2011 with the exhibition Future of a Promise, and then the Tunisian National Pavilion in 2017, uh, the first time Tunisia exhibited at Venice in 70 years. Today, Lazar splits her time between Europe and the Arab world working between London, Dubai, and Tunisia. Her biennial arts festival in the city of Tunis, Jao, will this year be a photographic exhibition exploring the human body. Um, today's talk will be recorded and it will be uploaded to the MISC Art Institute YouTube channel. If anybody has got any questions, feel free to put them in the chat and uh, we will try and make some time at the end to answer any questions. Um, I would now like to welcome our guest speaker, Lina Lazar. Hi, Oliver. Such a Hello. Pleasure. Such a pleasure to be with you tonight. <laughs> Thank you so much for meeting up with us um, on our little bit a later special for this month's um, during the holy month of Ramadan. So thank you very much for it. Well, thank you for making time. I can't complain about the timing. It's 3 a.m. where you are, so, <laughs> so we're good. <laughs> I'd like to start us off with, um, I guess, how you started your career. Um, I sort of introduced you as beginning in Sotheby's, but what sort of preceded that? How did you get into the scene? Look, it's, it's, um, it's interesting. It, look, at the end of the day, art and culture, I guess, were always um, kind of a priority in our household, in our family. Uh, growing up, it was something that was inherently a part of our kind of daily routine. Uh, my father is someone who is incredibly passionate about art, crafts, design, um, and is, you know, someone who should have really effectively been an architect who um, ended up in finance. And so uh, I think, I guess, that was very much a part of our upbringing. And, um, and you know, Nothing was really predicting me uh, specifically to it, given that my education per se was very much, you know, into, um, I graduated with a degree in economics and statistics. So really it, it, it had very little to do with, with, um, with um, a formal, you know, arts education. Um, mm. But then it's really effectively Sotheby's that kind of started me off on, on, on that journey, uh, the professional one at least, and it was, you know, a time that was very exciting in, 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 in the art world and particularly in the Arab art world, in the Arab art market because of, um, you know, very, very lack of visibility and representation generally in the West. Um, and at the time I was living in London, I had, you know, just integrated the, uh, con the International Contemporary Art Department in, in London uh, at Sotheby's. And um, we're talking back in 2005, 2006, and it was just around the time where the auction house was starting to you know, play around the idea of potentially introducing art, but contemporary art and standalone uh, auctions that would be completely kind of separated from the traditional way of, of, of featuring Arab artists, which was historically in the back of Islamic art catalogs. So like kind of historical objects. And then at the end of the you know, 700 um, Islamic art objects, you had kind of 20, 30 um, artists from, from the Arab world. And, and it was, you know, it's just the beginning, I guess. Um, mm. And that was really exciting because it was um, a carte blanche given by the auction house. So you were able to spend, you know, months at a time kind of crisscrossing the region, trying to understand in, and, and, and trying to be as, as, as accurate as, as possible with respect to um, the, representation of uh, these stories and the different stories that needed to be told within uh, the Arab world at a time where there was very little being published on, 
on, on Arab art, let alone uh, being taught on, on Arab visual arts in universities in, in Europe and so on. So Sotheby's, I think, was very much a pioneer in that sense of, mm. of really believing in um, the power of, of, of researching, of critically thinking about uh, art from the Arab world uh, early on and on, 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 on really making a point of integrating almost naturally within the kind of the more, I guess, mainstream canon, the international contemporary art canon uh, and practice. So that was, that was quite exciting. And so where did you sort of go from there? So you sort of 2005, 2006, you're starting in Sotheby's. Where are you sort of, have you got an idea that you want to move more permanently into the Arab world or are you looking at staying in London longer? You know, it was interesting, Oliver, because at the time, first of all, Sotheby's had, was actually quite active in the region. So mm. it had opened, we had opened at the time in 2007 offices in Doha and um, I was very much um, kind of trying to um, really build with, with our team, ground up this, this market. Um, and I didn't really, um, this longing to be in the Arab world wasn't um, urgent at the time. I think it was, it, it felt more pressing for us to represent as much the Arab world in the West and, and reintegrate, as I said earlier, the, like the broader narrative. Um, mm. and, and I guess because it was early days within that art market, uh, what happened was that you had a lot more flexibility as a young specialist. I mean, we're thinking we're like baby specialists, like really starting very young. Um, and, you know, we were, I was fortunate to really be able to generally like travel throughout, I mean, the Middle East, you know, including uh, Iran extensively and so on. And, and, um, and I think that the company just had this appetite to explore different avenues, which meant that as a young specialist, um, I was given you know, the opportunity to play with also non-traditional uh, outlets such as you know, uh, the Venice Biennial, uh, when it came down to 2011 and curating kind of the first uh, Pan-Arab uh, pavilion with Edge of Arabia at the time, who were extremely active um, in, in, in the Saudi art scene. Uh, and and the and the regional one, so I think in the, in, in that respect, I must I, I must say I've been very very grateful to Sotheby's for giving me that, you know, bandwidth and that freedom to to play and have a foot a foot in the commercial world, but also trying to find the more um, the gentler and more genuine also um, uh, ways of of uh, of bringing art to a broader audience. And so when you're sort of working for Sotheby's in the sort of mid-2000s period, is the concept of a curator for you something that you had really um, attached yourself to or as a professional goal? No, honestly, not at all. And to be honest, it was a terminology that and definition that always scared me because I didn't feel like I had the legitimacy to do it. You see, mm. I, I, didn't, you know, I didn't have... A, I didn't have a, a, as I said, an art historical background. Yes, I ended up doing a master's in, 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 temp, in contemporary art, but um, I very much learned it on the, in the field and you know, with the sheer volume of, of, of artworks we were seeing at Sotheby's with literally thousands of artworks a year. Um, mm. I guess my, my personal eye aesthetic and, and, and understanding of, of, of how, you know, um, the, what is the methodology that can be used to bring together artworks to create a broader uh, conversation has very much developed on the field. And so becoming a curator wasn't something that I wasn't necessarily aware of or aspiring to. I mean, of course, I looked up to, you know, some of the incredible curators that were uh, practicing at the time and still do. Um, but I guess I was, I was more, um, I had more of an, an urgency to, to work with artists and that I was conscious of. And I realized quite early on that, you know, the commercial world was very exciting to me at that first decade because it seemed like the only outlet to put the spotlight on, 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 on the artist and find ways of, of meaningfully 
uh, supporting them and allowing them to enter into gallery uh, uh, spaces and being signed up by, you know, um, uh, the primary market and organizing, you know, uh, major exhibitions and institutions and so on. And all of that really started off um, within the Arab art market, at least through the, 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 the market um, route early on. And then, like with any market, things kind of trickle down and and information becomes a little bit more perfect and the interest is there and, and you know just the general ecosystem grew and matured and and so building up auctions and 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 producing auction catalogs didn't feel as exciting anymore um, because I felt like I was much more interested in you know some of the bigger pictures and and real kind of issues worth um, Kind of putting an accent on and 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 really um, going after in terms of both you know social political social cultural urgencies of, of our part of the world so that was really what drove me um, yeah yeah and it's it's interesting to hear you talk about it sort of the flexibility of the commercial market at this time because yeah i suppose that they we're talking the sort of years leading up to the Arab Spring. And so there is really a different kind of lens on the Arab world in this period coming up to that sort of 2011. That's right. And, and the future of the promise happened effectively in 2011. So it was a time where everything was kind of suspended. Um, there was a huge sense of expectations from, you know, this broad region called the Arab world with no real understanding of what was you know, about to happen and, and the multiplicity and the multiple ways of, of, uh, and of ways the, you know, history was going to um, unfold. Um, mm. So I think there was an appetite at the time to, to explore and to say, well, hang on, let's pause for a minute and all right, maybe the auction, um, you know, format is not necessarily what we're after, but if you're really, really excited about working with you know, X number of artists and with these, and, and if you feel that this generation of artists has something bigger and more important to say, then yes, if you want to take a sabbatical and, and, and spend, you know, a year working uh, on the Venice Biennial, go for it. And, and you know, I, I was very lucky. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, and from there, you know, I moved to Saudi and I was um, also, you know, quite excited to see, we're talking 10 years ago, um, see and, and, and get a feel for the um, kind of the local ecosystem. I had just moved there and I, I genuinely wanted to understand what was uh, happening and what sort of um, grassroots energies were kind of brewing um, within mm. the creative uh, industry. And, and that's how, you know, Jeddah Art Week or Zhao, uh, which were kind of the, the, the short um, uh, an acronym for, um, for Jeddah Art Week Zhao, um, which also means um, the, the atmosphere or the, the feel for like what's mm. in the air, you know, the, the feel for the place. And, and so that was in 2012. And again, I was still at Sotheby's at the time and I basically, um, did that much more on a local level and it was very much about trying to get to know uh, the different stakeholders and understanding how one could create cultural platforms that would allow a cross section of the population that wouldn't normally meet to actually be together and think together about important issues of the time and i guess that's what really for me is more almost more interesting than the, I mean, for me, the curatorial dimension, the, the one that excites me the most is the one that actually allows for the different cross section of a community to get together. That is uh, the essential part of, of, of what I, I think a, a great exhibition has to achieve. Um, yeah. These languages um, and a language that almost transcends any kind of social, economical, um, and, 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 and just general cultural barriers, so to speak. Um, and so Jeddah was an amazing, amazing platform because that was, you know, a time where mixed events didn't, simply were not happening. I mean, as I said, it was 2000 and, 
and 12. And so first edition was very much of Jadar Creek was very much kind of closed off, mainly gallery, local galleries, local artists doing pop-up in their studios and a few group shows. Edge of Arabia was involved again. Um, they were actually, you know, kind of the main producer of the event and they did something pretty extraordinary there. And then in 2013, I decided to, you know, be a little, uh, um, to experiment a little bit further and kind of use the, the um, you know, the incredible brand and the equity of Sotheby's to say, all right, how about bringing very important highlight of international contemporary art into Saudi Arabia? Um, what should one bring uh, to Saudi under these circumstances? And what are the sort of conversations that can happen there? But effectively, Oliver, what was, it was almost like a pretext to bring again that kind of big leverage brand highlight onto what was happening locally. So Sotheby's came in uh, and we brought the first kind of uh, exhibition highlights bringing, you know, the likes of Kusama and Damien Hurst and Fontana and, and really these kind of blue chip contemporary art figures into an art scene that had never really effectively put together an international exhibition in the public domain. Um, but that edition of Jadar, we try to really do a little bit of that, but also, um, as I said, try and, 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 and kind of uh, intelli not, not try and cover some of the more relevant and, 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 and kind of urgent topics of the time. And at the time, I don't know if you remember, but in 2013, the country was going what had just started its kind of Saudization process. And you know, a quarter of the of the, of the foreign uh, Filipino working community internationally was working in Saudi Arabia, um, and of course they were going to be, um, you know, somehow, you know, quite affected by this decision, which otherwise was a very positive decision. But it was about to, you know, how does one engage with that community, and how does one create a space for that community to understand and and actually deal with these changes and, 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 and be given you know, a moment to, to, to reflect and, and debate it and, and converse it within the, the, that specific community. So uh, what happened there was that I worked with really extremely talented photographers, 50 photographers from um, originally from you know, uh, the Philippines who for some had been living for decades in Saudi Arabia who uh, were effectively given carte blanche to try and give, it, give us a little bit of an insight into what their understanding of Jeddah was. And you know, there's mm -hmm. this thing in Saudi that everybody knows, which is Jeddah Ghair. You know, Jeddah is always different. Uh, and so uh, we, we worked together and we, we, we produced at the time this show called Kaikabang Jeddah, which meant Jed the different Jeddah, the different side of Jeddah. Um, and so these really talented photographers who were effectively non-professional artists who were, you know, for a lot of them working with families, you know, doing all sorts of uh, more intimate and kind of household uh, uh, work from you know, uh, driving, housekeeping and, 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 and all, of, uh, all, all of kind of that plethora of, of, uh, of, uh, of employment. And, were supremely passionate about photography and they actually spent for most, you know, their weekends photographing themselves and their communities and their baptisms and their, mm. you know, Christmas and New Year's and weddings. And, and that was quite beautiful. And so the exhibition was able to, to be staged during Jeddah Art Week. So imagine you have this big highlight show with like Damien Hurst, Kusam, and then there's like this, you know, Taikal Bank Jeddah taking place. And then there's, you know, another, um, Saudi artists discussed at the time um, having an entire series on the Mutawa um, uh, in, in, in Saudi and then Edge of Arabia and, and of course the vibrant gallery scene was like, you know, booming and Ether and, and, um, and the Hafiz Gallery and so it was, it was the, the, the I guess the, um, the offer was strangely unharmonious in a way that made it truly interesting. And that was um, only something you would notice if you looked at the crowd who actually turned up for the exhibition, which was so diverse. Uh, mm. And at the time, I mean, 
it was it was a very moving experience for me personally. It was Seven thousand people showed up, and it was effectively the first kind of openly mixed, you know, blasting music. I mean, now we hear of Middle East and all these incredible initiatives in Saudi, but I'm talking ten years ago, you know, where a DJ yeah. makes a public space with a man and woman, like looking at art, was completely, you know, taboo. Um, mm. So that was fun, and, um, and 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 by that point, that's when I realized. That, you know, as much as I loved the auction house, my heart was elsewhere. And, and I kind of, that's when I was, of course, very grateful for Sotheby's, but then I, that's when I decided to kind of um, open a new chapter and a new journey, one that would be much more kind of independent and, and personal and, um, and about, you know, working with artists and developing these kind of broader, more, more urgent themes uh, that I, cared more deeply about. And what it sounds like here is you're really creating community through arts movements and through arts projects and trying to bring people together to experience um, a moment in time. And I think that's one thing which is quite impressive about the visual arts is it has this, or even all performance art, is it has this moment for people to come and share a moment and experience and hear somebody else's take on what's happening around them you know, or hear a curator's yeah. take on how that moment in time or that artwork in time is really an impact of what's happening today. And so creating those moments, I can see why you've kind of moved away from the auction house um, and that sort of commercial world into a space which is more actually pressing. There's a certain urgency that's within the um, Arab world at the time and possibly also in your career to sort of move into the next phase. Yeah, and then remember, I mean, these 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 events weren't happening in the vacuum because, you know, for example, in the context of that edition of Jeddah Art Week, we had a full-fledged symposium, you know, happening mm -hmm. in an old girls university at the Dar al Hikmah at the time, with like very interesting intellectual speakers, thinkers, you know, coming for the first time, gathering around uh, local kind of intellectuals. So it was a real kind of cross-fertilization of talents of thinking uh, that was happening around. And the art, and the art was really the pretext, the excuse for everybody to get together, you know. Uh, and, and that's the part, um, I guess, uh, about art and visual arts that I that I really uh, I'm quite um, I'm quite excited about. Although I must say that now increasingly I feel like, and 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 you've said it um, just now, I feel like the visual arts alone is less able to mobilize and to. Um, and academia in general, I mean, the, the, the combination of, of visual art and, um, I guess, critical thinking together is, you know, incredibly interesting. And on a personal level, I'm, you know, um, but in terms of audience building, I don't feel like it is necessarily always the best um, kind of trick to get uh, the audience going and get really the audience committed and loyal into a program and what I've now started to, I guess, realize and, and really implement in our own program and, and, and the work that uh, I do now is really making an, a very kind of consistent um, effort in continuously connecting artists with musicians, with writers, with poets, making sure that there's like a performative element that could be contemporary dance or theater, and it could be a pocket theater, it could be but, but I think that there's this, you know, art now has to be, and I don't know if it's, who knows if it's because it's, you know, all of a sudden competing with all these kind of experience driven kind of online um, uh, dimensions, or, or I, I have no idea, but what I know is that there is this desire to experience art differently and the, 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 the other arts when well, combined and when partnerships happen in a way that's really kind of uh, meaningful between music and contemporary art and and dance or theater I mean magic happens because then all of a mm. sudden you know someone who's not necessarily and I see this in Tunis all the time you know people who say you know a contemporary art is not really for me I don't you know either I don't get it or I don't have the background or no one's really explained it to me or I, it's not for me and there's this kind of prejugé this kind of um, quite an elitist um, uh, baggage or preconception about contemporary art that is 
you know, very difficult to unshackle, particularly with the con more conceptual uh, yeah. uh, art. And, um, and I feel like music is that entry point that allows for audiences to come for an interesting gig. And then all of a sudden they come through the gallery spaces and they realize that the musician actually did the, you know, the soundtrack of the show and the movie was mixed with, you know, some field recording from the neighborhood and the two worlds, you know, collide and, and, and something else happens. And then all of a sudden, huh, is this still contemporary art? And then people are unsure because all of a sudden it becomes more familiar and legible. Um, mm. Not being condescending or anything like that, but truly, I mean, it's an experience that's much more human. Um, Definitely. Or humanly um, kind of um, uh, appealing. So, uh, so yeah. And it also takes that, it takes it out of perhaps what can kind of be a bit like meta, you know, like when the art world be kind of becomes so self-referential that it's sort of hard to unpick what's art and what's just a conversation about art. And I suppose that's also part of community building and, and building your audience is taking art out of um, what are perhaps more historically recognised artistic spaces and bringing them back into the public sphere, you know. This is created for an audience. And if the audience is not going to come to the venue, take the artwork to the audience. And so absolutely. And, and not just take the art to the audience, but allow them to, to think about it, to talk about it differently. You know, mm. up, up until recently, I mean, this is something of like actually one of the biggest challenges we face. In what language do you communicate with your audience? So when you're in, you know, when you're I'm gonna take the example of Tunisia because this is actually the most recent one. I mean. Yesterday alone, we were having a big debate with the team and everyone's just banging the hands against the wall thinking that, so we, you, you of course want to use Arabic because that's your, you know, our national language, um, except that really like the Fusha, the classical Arabic is no longer really used on a daily basis by um, the younger generation, uh, the social media Gen Z uh, uh, generation is much more comfortable um, conversing and expressing themselves and feeling really, um, I guess, uh, English was it is more of a mode of self-expression, um, mm. and um, and so you've got English on one side and then you've got French, and the the whole like kind of um, colonial heritage that that entails and and the different position that the youth want to take vis-a-vis -vis of. Of, of the language. So then we have three languages and to be effective, you have to, you almost have to, to speak all three languages. And then in the end, we realized as, a, as an organization that we should be speaking Tunsi and Tunsi is not a formal language, it's a dialect, but it's actually what people speak. So all of a sudden we're having to rethink art theory, art you know, definition and critical, um, uh, uh, thinking and and uh, and knowledge production in Tunisia. How does that? And of course, I mean, we, we haven't hacked it yet, but it's something that we're very much aware of, and we're trying to to um, yeah. to, to you know dive into. And it's also a really exciting moment because with um, I suppose languages that don't have a historic or classical involvement within the arts, there's a great opportunity to create new vocabulary as well. So you begin to start thinking about, okay, how are we going to describe this in the language that is most used by the people? And you get this moment of going, okay, we're going to opt into other languages or are we going to make our own here? Make our own. And, and, the, and, and there's a really strong um, desire to make our own at the moment. And the mm. own it's decomplex, it's it's confident, it's it it takes a little bit of here, a little bit of there, and and it's happy to compose with what works. Uh, and it's not always visual as well, which is quite nice because it it has you know a sensorial, a a, a musical component. It it really borrows from multiple universes to create this kind of unique uh, uh, vocabulary. So take us to Tunis now with um, the current festival, Zhao. So you've got a biennial festival, um, which is born out of this Jeddah Art Week and then transplanted to the city of Tunis. Um, what took you to Tunis in the first place? Well, look, I'm originally Tunisian. Both my parents are from Tunisia. I was born in Saudi and, um, and raised in Switzerland. Then, you know, 
a big chunk of my adult life was was in the UK in in, in London. Um, but um, no, I felt that Tunisia, and I still feel like Tunisia is one of the rare places in the Arab world that's um, quite generous in its ability to host different um, thought leaders, different uh, canons, different um, um, views, opinions, sometimes differing ones. Um, it's, it's, it's quite a beautiful, neutral Mediterranean ground that's very hospitable, um, um, that is quite welcoming in, in, in its, even in something as simple as, you know, its visa um, regulations. People are, you know, Arabs can still come to Tunisia. Of course, there are, it's not ideal and there are a lot of nationalities for which we have to fight uh, to get visas for, uh, you know, when it comes to our artist residency, for example. You know, it is, it is still a, a, a struggle in some instances, but all in all, we are fortunate enough to allow for um, artists and the creative kind of thinkers to be together physically in the Arab world. And I thought that that was also another very important challenge uh, for us to take on that, you know, the, the really critical conversation don't always happen in London and Paris and Berlin, but they should happen back home and they should mm. happen to see if they have to be and they should, um, yeah, it, it, it's, I think it's fundamental to the authenticity of, of the discourse and, and its ability to uh, inspire um, really other communities elsewhere. So that was a big challenge. It's, of course, very difficult because, you know, unlike other parts of the world, there's very little infrastructure. Um, and so when there's no infrastructure, you take art to the streets. When you don't have a contemporary art museum, you exhibit on billboards. When you don't, you know, when you, and it, you know, allows you to be a little bit more creative with, um, with the way you engage with your audience. And, and I must say that it's been really rewarding because we don't have these kind of, um, I guess, Western institution world old problems. We're not mm. talking about how do you bring in the youth into the space because we have this, you know, crazy infrastructure we've had inherited 50 years ago. What do we do with our buildings? We don't have these problems. So if the youth wants it to be in a festival format in the desert, then that's what it is. And if it has to become digital, then of course, I don't want to mean to, I mean, I don't want to over romanticize the situation because we are very keen on having more infrastructure and, and all artists in Tunisia are desperate to see the museum, you know, a proper decent museum being able to celebrate our history and, and, and our rich uh, uh, culture. But that hasn't stopped um, the scene um, that has allowed the scene to, you know, still reorganize itself. And I think that's also, I guess, the power of, of culture, this ability to reorganize. It's like very, it's like water. It, it will infiltrate mm. any, any holes, it will infiltrate any cracks, any curves, and it will allow to exist no matter, no matter what the circumstances. So yeah, so that's yeah. and it's happening in October. And it's multiple curators uh, working on under um, the leadership of Qadr Atiya. Um, it's going to be primarily photography with a lot of um, dance, theater, um, and music. And we're hoping to have as much of, of it as possible in 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 the open, you know, open and free to all, like in in, in really in the in the public space. Uh, but that's a tradition that's been started in in Tunisia quite a while ago, and we don't get the credit for that. I mean, we, we have a number of incredible organizations who are doing pretty spectacular work in terms of you know, public space engagement. For example, you know, La Rue is, is, a, is an amazing association that has started 10 years ago a festival called Dream City that's actually happening alongside Zhao, which will be a, probably a week before Zhao. Uh, and they're doing, their, their motto has always been, you know, art in the street. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, so Zhao is happening in October. B7 and 9 is another, that's really my baby project. Um, that is um, effectively a space, um, you know, there's been this whole debate about, you know, art's ability to empower and to socially, um, you know, create um, a, a, like a, a, a meeting or like a, a, a sense of, uh, transnational solidarity and 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 the ability to 
kind of action uh, activist thinkers to really like make change and implement change and so on. And, and if we've never really, at least at, at, at personally speaking, I've never really been able to test that model. I mean, I, I understand it philosophically and, and, and I understand it in, you know, in my soul, I, I get it. Um, but we wanted to, to really like go, you know, all in and see what happens when art is effectively like injected in a place where that is completely disenfranchised, that has absolutely no access to um, formal, um, I guess, uh, artistic program. Um, and what happens when that specific community has other urgencies, when those communities are worried about getting bread in the morning and, and getting employed at the end of the day and, you know, uh, losing their job because of, of a pandemic, et cetera, et cetera. And we literally went and, and, and identified perhaps the poorest neighborhood in Tunis um, and didn't take a fancy building. We literally took over a, an old factory warehouse um, that we converted into kind of a white cube space with like a residency level and, and, a, and a coffee shop slash um, terrace of community you know, kind of get together. And we have uh, made a point of only working with artists who were keen on working locally with producing everything with, you know, the local artisans and craftsmen and so on, like literally in the same streets so from the wood maker to the metal work to the, you know, ceramics and so on. So everything, nothing is shipped. Uh, there's no like such thing as creating and shipping internationally. Um, Artists are Tunisian, but also international. Um, some of whom are actually, you know, quite established and 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 much more mature in their career. And and the idea is, you know, how do you reset? And and what happens when when the codes and the and the context of showing your art disappears entirely, and all the words vanish, and it's you and the community, and you have to find a way of engaging. And you must try and, and, and see what really connects you to one another. So it's quite challenging because not all artists are inherently socially engaged uh, to that extent. But it's also quite nice because it attracted the ones who are really passionate about that and that sort of praxis, you know. Um, and so that's called that's a space called B7 and Mind. It's mm -hmm. only two and a half years old, um, but it's a place where you can, you know come and have a live jam and, and have, you know, performers perform for this first time concerts it's, it, and in poetry and, and theater and exhibitions happening all simultaneously in a very, very kind of relaxed and, um, and um, I, I think, you know, in terms of, of, um, of vivre ensemble, it, 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 it's, it's, it's getting to a place that I'm, I'm quite happy about. Amazing. And it's also great to hear that your approach here is also not coming necessarily from a top down kind of institutional level, which can sometimes be a bit jarring for communities that if you kind of come from the socialist level and like, okay, we're going to create a space that is just space for you to come and go as you want and to make it what it needs to be to really impact your community. And this kind of mentality, especially in spaces, um, a lot of post-colonial spaces. This yeah. is something that is definitely part of the rhetoric um, around intersectionality, but a, a successful post-colonial state that has sovereignty also needs to create space for people to really kind of process what has happened and who they are and what it means to be their own sovereign nation now. So it's great to hear that you're creating this space within Tunis. Look, we're, we're figuring it out. We're trying to figure it out. It's this top-down approach is something that everyone's inclined to want to do, as any institution will do it. Uh, but we had to fight our urge to intervene too much. And uh, we were quite fortunate because we were able to identify really amazing team members who basically said, you know, let us compose this program, you know, ground up. Um, and, and they're really, they've been very good at, you know, at, at, at meaningfully hearing, listening, what you know our audience wanted to 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 hear, see, 
um, talk about, um, but that's not, you know, that, that, that kind of institutional, um, uh, you know, the, the top uh, uh, down uh, struggle is, is, is one that is constant. And, mm. and, and but, but you have to fight your urge to, to get too involved, you know? Um, which I think we're getting, we're finally getting the right balance. As I said, it's a baby space. It's only been there for two and a half years, but I'm getting the sense that uh, we're having to do less and less top-down program and more and more things coming to us and like bringing it, um, allowing the space to bring it back to the surface. And that equation is what allows me to think that maybe we're getting something right. Definitely. And so for, Zhao, uh, 2022, what are some of your, yeah, I suppose, what are some of your exhibitions that you're really going to push for us um, to see this year? Mm, so, as I said, a lot of it is going to be in the public space. Um, we have, um, we, we haven't announced all the curators, so it's a little bit tricky, uh, but, um, but I can tell you that it will be, um, it will be a, a, a citywide activation with uh, key partners that are working with similar values, similar kind of urgencies in that space with a very interesting symposium that's being put together um, that is that we're hoping to also be somehow um, our way to reactivate a platform you may or may not be aware, like familiar with called Adras, which was a Kind of the publishing wing, the online publishing wing of, of the of the of the KLF for a, for a decade, and we're we would very much like to try and see how the symposium could be a way of of trying to define the, the 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 driving themes of the next you know two three four uh, five years. So the symposium is going to be a symposium slash workshop uh, mm -hmm. slash you know thinking together. Um, a forum, so that's going to be a strong component, and of course, um, I mean, you have to come, Oliver. Like with, yeah. with all the conversation we've had, I'm now expecting you to to come to Tunis. You really must. Uh, I would love to host you there. Um, I'm there October. I swear, I'm there. <laughs> amazing, and and uh, you know, drama. Uh, we're a lot of the, a lot of the, I guess the residency uh, projects that are developed in B7 and Line are 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 developed within the space but then they have little teeny tiny kind of what we call exit of residency so where a time where you engage with an audience that's quite limited where you get critical feedback and you get a chance to interact with your public uh, but once that is fully cooked then we felt that it would be right to also give a second chance uh, to some of these practitioners to actually exhibit much more broadly so it's very much in line with our annual program. So kind of the what's what's worked on throughout the year gets selected. The, the projects that are really fully kind of baked and, and ready then are uh, displayed as part of, uh, of the, the festival. Which is part of a sustainable arts ecosystem, which is so important. And I'm so glad to hear that there is this sort of um, real sense of sustainability through the model as it exists. I'm now going to throw up um, to some of our attendees. If anyone would like to ask a question, um, feel free just to drop it in the chat. Um, you can find the chat if you click on the chat button at the bottom of the screen. Um, we've got about 15 more minutes of Lena's time. And if no one's got a question, I will jump right in. Um, I'd like you to take us back to 2017 for a moment. Um, and the first time that Tunisia um, had a pavilion at Venice and talk us a little bit around that exhibition and why um, yeah, why it was such a, an important moment for Tunis or for Tunisia sorry um, displaying at um, Venice. So it was so it was it was not exactly the first time it was the second time after so we had a national pavilion in 1948 and then nothing until 2017 which is not a reflection on the state of, of the arts or on, on, on the interest or the, or the tradition of, uh, of, uh, of visual arts in the country, not at all. It's just, unfortunately, a reflection on, on, on the policies around uh, cultural production and, um, and um, 
and um, I guess, you know, the little priority that the government has towards um, empowering its uh, creative community. Uh, in 2017, it was, um, you know, having not been there for 70 years, um, and I don't know if you remember, but 2017 was very much really straight after um, this horrific, I mean, uh, migration crisis that it's still ongoing, uh, that is still, you know, killing uh, weekly dozens of people on the shore of Tunisia and, 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 and most of the, the um, North Africa. Um, and um, at the time, you know, we were asked to represent what, you know, the Venice Biennale is all about, a moment in time trying to tell the story of a nation and the aspiration of its youth and what really defined Tunisia as in, in that specific moment in time. What are kind of the national aspirations and, and really, and in 2017, literally, like if you went and interviewed kids in the street in Tunis, half of them just wanted to cross the Med. They were like, you just want out. We want to be able to be, to, you know, to, to we call them um, burn the, the borders and like just get on boats and, and, and cross the Med. And so um, I decided at the time to, um, to basically organize, curate a non-traditional exhibition, which was going to be performance-based. And it was effectively like a, um, a we, we, we staged this performance that was effectively uh, document issuing centers that were scattered all around uh, Venice uh, that were manned by um, young Tunisian kids who were aspiring uh, migrants. I mean, I don't even know what the right terminology is. They're, they're aspiring kids who just who wanted out um, for all sorts of very, real and, and valid reasons that the irony of it is that because they were now all of a sudden performing migration, they were able to obtain a visa in an otherwise impossible uh, and, and completely um, kind of locked up uh, environment. So that was, that was quite, quite, a, quite an interesting performance. Of course, that wasn't the only presentation because you know physically this is what was happening in Venice. You, you know, as a, as, a, as a visitor, you were asked to queue for sometimes hours uh, and were handed over a frieza, which was a free visa uh, to circulate around the world a little bit, what you were like, what you were describing earlier with the kind of the passports that get distributed in these kind of universal exhibitions, expositions. Yeah, Dubai Expo, they had, everyone had a passport and, you know, everyone's happily going around stamping at every pavilion. Except that, mind you, this document was a real document because it was actually printed and designed by the same, you know, lab and company that issued Schengen, British visas, your Australian passport was probably issued by that. I mean, they basically produced like something 80% of all like the secure document, uh, uh, public documents um, around the world from like credit cards, to passports, currencies, and so on. So we reached out to them and we said, you know, if you were to actually do the reverse and, you know, stop limiting circulation and actually thought of a document that would give a laissez-passer to humanity to be able to be mobile again, what would it look like? And so they designed it, printed it, you know, secured it with every single kind of, uh, you know, uh, a kind of a securization system embedded, uh, UV light. I mean, all of it was integrated and when you put it under UV light, uh, it said only human. So destination unknown, um, uh, uh, origin unknown, and, um, and, and only human was the kind of the, 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 the word that, um, that uh, came out under UV light. And, and it was almost like a silent protest. So you could, as a, as, as a visitor, choose to stick it on your passport and confuse you know, entirely the custom officer who was going to open this thing on your passport because it was so real that, you know, like, where does it belong? Who is it? Who has it been issued? With? And it, of course, would made and has made for some quite interesting conversation that happened everywhere in, you know, all sorts of customs around the globe. Uh, so yeah. that was uh, the, the premise of that uh, participation. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, what an incredible, what an incredible work. And I suppose that, here we are um, in 2022 and 
We're seeing now um, migration crisis within Europe, especially with the invasion of um, Ukraine. And you, you can see how borders kind of become really porous for certain countries and not for others. And it does then raise questions and, and debates around um, what is humanity and are we still And selective very empathy. Yeah, Absolutely. selective empathy, yeah. Absolutely. I do, I do have um, a one quick question coming in from an attendee, um, Fana. Was there something hard to overcome in your career and did you uh, and become a lesson you stand by today? I mean, hard? Every day is hard. I wake up every morning thinking, my goodness, like, how is this going to work? I mean, most times, like, putting together an exhibition is excruciatingly painful. I literally go through a cycle of, oh, my God, this is awful. This is terrible. What was I thinking? How did I? Ah, and, like, to the point where you, you want to cancel it. And then, you know, you go through that entire cycle of, of self-doubt and, and, um, and extreme anxiety. At least for me, it, you know, curatorial work is, is extremely, extremely um, difficult. It doesn't come easy. It's something that um, really makes me question absolutely every um, aspect of what, why and how and, and whether the approach is sincere. Is it thoughtful enough? Is it robust enough? Is it this? I'm, I'm constantly questioning um, uh, myself. So that I think is, is, is quite difficult. But then I've learned to understand that this was maybe my way of processing um, um, you know, some work and, and, and perhaps the way that um, I like almost like a, the ultimate test to get me to really try and challenge myself a little bit better um, each time, if that makes sense. But overall, if there's one, um, one challenge, um, maybe definitions, not being too stuck on definitions and this notion of, you know, what are you, are you, I mean, I was always asked this question, but you're, you're an expert, but you really like effectively a dealer, but, but no, but hang on, you're a specialist in contemporary art, but you sell art. How could you be like now, you know, doing um, non-for-profit and what are these non, you know, commercial and now it's moving into, you know, multidisciplinary and this, that, and the other. And I think that early on, I guess 10 years ago, I was, I could get a little bit worried about where one belongs. Um, but I think that if, I guess, if, if you mean it and you're sincere about what you, you try and do, I think worry less about where it fits and whether it fits within the existing definitions because they're going to be meant to be disrupted one at one moment or the other. And, and things are constantly evolving. And so I guess that was maybe one of the challenges. Um, but no, I don't, you know, everybody, I think all curators, all art practitioners will, will tell you that it's, it's not straightforward. People think about it as this kind of ultra glamorous, very um, kind of smooth sailing experience. And it's not, it's, 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 it's very difficult, it's hard. It's really, really hard. Um, but, um, but it's extremely fulfilling at the same time. So it's, you know, worthwhile. <laughs> you, you raise a really interesting point there. And I feel like, especially within our industry, there's this idea that you either exist within the commercial sector or you exist within the nonprofit sector. And um, jumping between one sector to the other is a little bit taboo or it's not necessarily seen as very, um, people have a bit of trouble understanding or comprehending why you would go from one sector to the other one side of the sector to the other when in fact an ecosystem is that it has all of these elements and all these parts moving together um, yeah. and categorization is something that um, we as humans we either do because we've been taught to do it or it happens nat naturally and I'm not sure yet which it is because in a lot of this new museum theory um, we also talk about Getting breaking down all these categorizations. Yeah. Yeah. How does it actually help us, these categories? And that kind of plays further into your discussion around I'm only human um, in your passport, you know, that we we are sort of are always trying to categorize people into these little boxes. Oh, you're an expert in this, or you you come from this sector. And I suppose that 
in the arts of the future, I hope that we can kind of see it all blending it's, a little bit more. But can I tell you, it's happening already. I mean, if you look at Saudi Arabia, where uh, Miss Garth Institute is at the moment, I mean, honestly, the most exciting uh, kind of creatives that I've met in the last few trips were actually completely um, cross-disciplinary. I mean, they're, you know, DJing on the weekends and they do a bit of photography and video montage and then they'll help out the friend, you know, stitch a, like a graphic design uh, kind of a poster for a fashion label. And there's this sense that, you know, creativity shouldn't be uh, confined to one um, outlet. Uh, mm. And I think that, you know, if, uh, if that can be said for artists, I don't see why, you know, art practitioners shouldn't be also given a bit more flexibility there. And I'm not saying that, you know, a curator should become a dealer per se. And I know that that would be maybe a little bit problematic for other reasons, of course, um, mm. uh, in terms of, you know, uh, uh, potential uh, conflicts of interest. And the minute financial uh, uh, sector gets involved or if the financial component gets involved into an equation, things can be a little bit... Um, but I suppose if we have networks of ethics that then really uphold yeah. ethical standards, then we don't, yeah, then it won't be such an issue because then we can say, hey, look, this is an ethical boundary that we have chosen not to cross. And, um, but it's that thing of, you know, putting, making sure that everyone feels confident, you know, creating, creating an ecosystem where everyone feels supported and that there's, um, and that we can kind of draw upon each other and have dialogue across the industry, which is something that um, And it's I happening, don't... Oliver. Yeah. I mean, look, you think, I mean, some people will argue that, you know, the Venice Biennial is, I mean, I'm gonna be completely controversial now, but some people will say, well, actually it's the longest art fair in the world. You know, artworks are being produced and then collectors are going around and, and you know, shopping for great art in a non-for-profit kind of uh, institutional exhibition format definitions i mean where does it stand where does the rule apply doesn't is is, uh, is less relevant i think yeah and then we get then we get meta and we start talking about our industry so i think we've come to our time unless anyone's got any last questions um this has been our virtual talk number four in conversation with lina nazar um, my name is Oliver Farrell. I'm from the MISC Art Institute. And uh, thank you very much, Lena, for your time today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Okay. Uh, thank you. Bye-bye now. Bye. -bye now. Bye.